Hey guys, I want to put together a video here to cover the uh, very basics of fiber optic cables and optical cables. Uh, for anyone who's new to the networking industry or perhaps just studying, studying for certifications and, and hasn't had any hands-on yet with fiber optics, um, there's plenty of things I learned when I was just starting out that, uh, that I feel like maybe could be beneficial to anyone who's just getting going. Um, what I have in front of the webcam view here is uh, two different fiber cables. They're both little uh, like three meter cables. They're not very large. And uh, I'll come back to those in just a moment. Um, on the screen there, you can see the different types of, uh, of uh, terminations for fiber optic cable. Um, so with ethernet, you're typically gonna be dealing with the RJ45, but with fiber, you're gonna see a bunch of different connectors. And you won't see all of them. Uh, it really depends on what position you hold and, and what your uh, exposure is to fiber cable um, but uh, but you will see quite a few of them it just depends on what their the purpose is for that given cable now I only have two examples of uh, physical cables to show you um, I have a I have an SC uh, duplex SC connector here and then I have ST connector and uh, the other cable that I have the yellow cable has ST connectors on both sides so Unfortunately, I thought I had a LC to show you, but I do not. I picked up these cables uh, on a work trip. There was a little neat little electronic store that sold um, computer components and things that you wouldn't find at your typical local electronic store. Kind of a bit more of a nerdy store. So I picked up a couple to, to use in a video here. So um, when 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 you you're looking at these uh, these cables in the video, you're probably wondering. Uh, what's the difference between orange and yellow uh, or you may have not even thought about it yet at all and when you're dealing with ethernet you're going to see uh, plenty of times where ethernet cables are different colors to um, to specify or to identify what their purpose is their purpose and intent so perhaps in a hospital environment you might use uh, green cables for patch cables coming out of the wall going to a workstation you might use blue back in the server room going between a server and a server switch. Um, every different organization has their own standards for cabling colors for Ethernet. When it comes to fiber, uh, it isn't necessarily always the case, but for the most part, what you're gonna find is orange is multi-mode and yellow is single mode. And the differences between the two relate to the size of the core and how much light can uh, make its way through the core. Excuse me. <clears throat> so, I've got a uh, little picture here up on the uh, main screen. You can see single mode fiber on the, the top diagram and multi-mode fiber on the bottom. Um, there's 50 micron versus 62.5 micron. Specifies differences in core and, uh, and um, cladding size. Um, the, all, all the fiber cables have a couple of components that make them up from the core working their way out to the cladding, coating, and buffer. Uh, undersea cables and a couple other interesting circumstances uh, are even more industrialized than than this picture and then the cables that you can see but when, when we're talking about the single mode versus uh, multi-mode the general idea is multi-mode um, you can get more out of it at shorter distances but you're going to look at uh, db loss and signal attenuation uh, over long distances uh, kind of like you're familiar with uh, ethernet only being able to go certain distances before you start experiencing signal loss so single mode with the tighter core um, can keep the the light reflections shooting through it in um, in a, a manner that's going to allow for less db loss along the way so single core or i'm sorry single mode is what you are going to use more than likely for long distance runs circuits things that are going miles at a time whereas with multi-mode is something you're going to see more often in a lan environment um, because you can uh, you can use it without the signal loss and you can get a little bit more through it. So uh, again, I have an SC connector here. These fiber cables typically come with caps on them to cover up uh, the ends. So take those off before you uh, insert it into any SFPs um, or fiber NICs on a workstation. When I say SFPs, um, put that picture up there on the screen for you. That is uh, an example of an LC SFP. That's something that you're gonna see you're not going to see the whole thing um, unless you're installing it yourself, but you're going to see the end sticking out of a um, switch uh, with SFP modules. Now, this is an extreme example. This is a 3750X by Cisco, 
and every single port on the switch is a is an sfp bay where you can put those sfps in various different kinds of sfps if you like or different speeds and then you can plug these fiber cables directly into those um the quite a few of the the access level switches will have gigabit ethernet ports for the main 48 ports or however large the switch is and then possibly a couple sfp modules over on the end uh, for your uplink connection um, so that's how those that's how sfps come into play those are going to be where your cables terminate other than obviously a fiber net kind of workstation if you're running fiber all the way out to your your end users um, and take the caps off here it's pretty straightforward uh, light runs through uh, through the core the SFP or the workstation will have a uh, transmitting side and a receiving side so um, when you're when you're putting cable in place obviously there's a chance where if you have transmit talking to transmit the communications not going to come up so uh, you may have to for example flip um, flip your connections and plug them into the opposite sides if, if that happens to be the case um, now they are typically labeled and or color coded but if you have a couple of uh, patches along the way then that can be an issue that you run into another issue you may run into with fiber that I've experienced in the past is speed mismatches some of these SFPs like on the screen here are uh, hard coded to certain speeds <clears throat> and uh, if you have one set to, or I shouldn't say set to, if you have one SFP that is hard set at 100 meg connection and you have another one that's hard set at 1 gig connection, there's going to be issues where you may see the port stay down down on both sides and they just won't communicate correctly and you will think that it's either a layer 1 uh, issue somewhere else or, or that there's a weird quirk um, with that SFP being compatible with your device. Um, but that's something to keep in mind is that speed speed matching is kind of a um, bigger issue with the with the hard set SFPs than uh, than you'll see with Ethernet um, got a couple other interesting uh, pictures to show you uh, this is what you're gonna see uh, out in the field if you end up being a field tech for fiber optics for maybe a ISP or uh, something along those lines you'll see and you may have seen these before and just not realize what they were typically they have these little mobile fiber optic repair uh, vehicles either vans or utility trucks or trailers and uh, the manhole covers are typically access to uh, you know obviously uh, sewer systems but oftentimes underground fiber runs that traverse um, underground is one way you can run them uh, you can trench it out in areas where you don't have the concrete or you can trench through the concrete and uh, close it back up. Trenching and running fiber is going to be the most uh, expensive part. That's what I've heard from uh, reading online and plenty of places where people have tried to start their own ISP is that running the fiber initially is the most expensive part. Everything after that is pretty easy. So you want to make sure that your fiber is nice and secure as well because fiber is more susceptible to breaking than Ethernet cable. Um, this one I already broke prior uh, on accident when I was messing around with it, but uh, in order to break fiber, um, it's it's pretty simple. You basically just give it a little pinch, and it just broke right there. So that is no longer going to be usable. Um, and this can happen by just having the fiber be run over by something, stepped on wrong, twisted, uh, pulled. So fiber, uh, you have to be careful and you have to secure it uh, a little bit more when you're running running these cables. Um, uh, here's another example of overhead fiber um, run on utility poles so it's quite often you're driving by plenty of fiber every day and just not seeing it up on the utility poles they're running alongside the power cables and the uh, uh, the traditional um, phone line cables and whatnot uh, here's another overview of underground fiber kind of coming across through a tunnel system here um, and I want to show you this map here. Uh, this shows the undersea fiber connections between different countries in the world. And there's better maps out there, and you can pull these up on the internet. But um, it's pretty it's pretty interesting to see the various paths. And uh, this is essentially the backbone of the internet when you talk about traversing. And they will literally run these with boats. They will just uh, run out with a boat and run the fiber behind it. And uh, the fiber is pretty well protected. You can see an example in a picture like this. You can see how large the uh, shielding is around some of this stuff. And um, 
And uh, if there's undersea fiber cuts, it often takes quite a while to get that repaired. They have to send out a boat and uh, kind of hook and pull the, the fiber from underneath. So um, that's about all. Uh, I got a cross section pictures here. Those are always fun to look up if you have some chance or some time to look. This is actually copper, it looks like, for the most part. But, uh, um, but uh, there's pictures online of uh, cross sections of undersea. Uh, cable and it's always interesting to see how many precautions they take to uh, ensure that it remains physically secured with various uh, layers around the outside um, so uh, essentially that's uh, pretty much it you got multi-mode for your shorter distances you can get a little bit more through it you got single mode for your longer distances where DB loss is an issue um, quick way to test these fiber cables when you go to install them you can actually take a light and uh, shoot it down one side and you'll be able to see it out the other end uh, ever so slightly. It's uh, not a very large uh, core that it comes out for you to visibly see it with your eye, but you can see that. You can kind of, that'll give you a rough estimate on if that cable is good or not. Uh, better way would be to use a fiber pen light tester. Um, they make these uh, pen size devices that you can, they actually fit over the caps of these fiber really well, and they shoot a stronger uh, laser emitted pulse that you can see you can switch it between solid or blinking and that'll give you a better chance to test longer distances um, you want to be careful when you're dealing with fiber as far as looking into the ends of the fibers you'll see warning labels often because the uh, some of the light sources are not visible to the human eye but they can be damaging to the eye so uh, when you're testing just be careful with that um, if you have the ability to just shut off a light and just see if you see the light coming out the uh, the test light coming out that might be a better bet um, they also make um, OTDR handheld devices um, for testing DB loss. So if you're having issues with uh, connection and it goes over a couple patches, uh, throw an OTDR on, uh, on both ends and it's going to be able to tell you what you're looking at for DB loss and, uh, and that'll give you an idea. It, it also, OTDRs are capable of showing you at what what portion of the cable is experiencing the issue so it might tell you uh, after the first patch is when you're starting to have an issue so then you can talk to your provider and and tell them where you're seeing the the problem and they can check it out and uh, and get back to you um, that's about all I can think of for the 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 real basics of of setting up fiber um, of any issues I've run into um, the different connection types are all pretty straightforward. You just need to make sure that uh, that you have a plan for uh, you know both ends, what you're plugging it into, so you know which kind of connections you need. Um, and uh, that's about it. It's pretty straightforward. Um, again, there's a lot more information online as far as how splicing fiber works, how crimping the ends on fiber works. Uh, there's devices for pretty much all of those aspects that are more intricate than your typical RJ45 crimper uh, because you have to line things up so correctly in order to get the light to travel through the core correctly. Um, and, uh, and there's also different uh, bits of information online as far as metrics for uh, what you can expect speed-wise and uh, what you can get distance-wise out of various different types of uh, of fiber. Um, there are Ethernet standards that compete. Fiber is obviously good for uh, easily getting you up to one gig speeds or, or higher. Um, the Cat Cat 6, Cat 5e, um, uh, Cat 6 at least gets you up to uh, one gig easily, but uh, there are also Ethernet standards to get 10 gig through Ethernet, um, and those are different. I believe they go up to Cat 7 and 8 for those. They're, uh, uh, well, they're probably not newer standards at this point, but um, but if you're looking for a more reliable method, fiber is obviously the way that's going to get you there. You get a, a bit bigger SFP or GPIC that gets you up to 10 gig, and all you have to do is slap a fiber cable on it. You don't have to worry about purchasing all different cable uh, as far as the Ethernet side goes. So hope that's been a little bit more uh, information for you if you were unfamiliar with anything to do with fiber, and thanks for watching.